Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, ma'am, for being part of the podcast. Uh, I'd like to begin with you, Ambassador Juster. You have over 40 years experience uh, in government service, public policy, and you served as U.S. ambassador to India from 2017 to 2021. Uh, you recently said that uh, frictions and frustrations limit the potential of U.S.-India trade ties. Uh, could you elaborate on that? Well, when I was ambassador, my uh, commercial counselor said to me about trade between the United States and India, it's never been better. And in a sense, he was right that it's gone up every year, uh, as far as I can remember. When I first began working on the relationship in 2001, the bilateral trade was about $19 billion. Uh, last year, I believe it was over $160 billion or in that neighborhood. So it clearly has increased steadily. And yet at the same time, for the world's largest economy, the United States, and its fifth largest economy, India, I don't think it's filling, fulfilling its potential. And indeed, we've tried over a number of years to resolve various trade frictions, and we still can't do it in certain areas, in agricultural areas and the like. Uh, and I'd love to see us ultimately have a free trade agreement, but we haven't gotten there. So the trade relationship has grown tremendously. There are a lot of natural ties between us. And yet at the same time, I think it has a fair amount of potential still to fulfill. What about the security dialogue? Do you think that, that has, uh, there are roadblocks in that too? No, look, this, all aspects of the relationship have grown incredibly over the last 22 years. If you step back and see where we were, uh, 22 years ago and where we are today, it's extraordinary. And we discuss every issue of human endeavor. Uh, and security and trade are two of the big ones. And they both have grown. And security also, uh, remember, we're not allies. Hmm. Indeed, the United States are strategic partners. But we've enhanced our security ties over the years. India has now purchased over $20 billion of US equipment. We have military exercises across a range of our services. We, when I was ambassador, we began the first tri-services exercise called Tiger Triumph. Uh, and we have talks about a whole range of issues. So uh, this is a, a process of steady improvement and uh, really greater comfort. And we've seen that both in the bilateral relationship and how we work together uh, in the Quad and other ways as well. So what, what are the roadblocks? We still don't have a U.S. ambassador in India for two years now. Well, I don't think that's a roadblock in the relationship. I think the relationship has continued to prosper. And we just read a, uh, a press meeting with uh, the Secretary of State and uh, the Minister of External Affairs, along with their Australian uh, and uh, Japanese counterparts. And you could see it's a very strong relationship. Obviously, I have a bias in saying that having an ambassador on the ground can only enhance it further. There are a lot of things that uh, a good ambassador can do. You're I have a 10 and a half hour time difference between our two countries. Uh, an ambassador can really understand the nuance of a government's positions, the different personalities, what people in and outside of government say, and also communicate to India the nuance that's coming out of Washington. So it, it helps enhance communications and to uh, deal on a day-to-day -day basis with issues that uh, at the ministerial level you can only engage on uh, episodically and not as regularly. Mm -hmm. Uh, Mr. Raza, I'll come to you. You worked in the CIA and in various capacities in counterintelligence, Ministry of Defense. In your view, are there differences in perception uh, about India among Democrats and Republicans? No, I'd say overall the desire uh, amongst U.S. policymakers, both Republican and Democratic, to have a stronger strategic relationship with India. Um, that, that is across the board. Uh, there's some fringes in each party that may think differently about that. But if you look at who the real decision makers are, you know, India is extremely important and uh, Americans generally desire to have that partnership be as strong as possible. And in the broader context, that commitment to a free and open uh, Indo-Pacific is absolutely there. Uh, so Washington is looking to New Delhi as a critical partner, and Washington is very eager to see India take a bigger role on the global stage. So is there a bipartisan view about this? Because in India, uh, the view is that the Democrats view India with suspicion. I wouldn't say that at all. If you look at uh, Secretary Blinken's visit here, for example, at the Raisina Dialogue and for the G20 gathering, the United States, uh, the Democratic Party, has a very strong desire to engage with India 
And um, that is not uh, a partisan issue in Washington. It's very much bipartisan. Uh, Even the, in national security matters? Absolutely. Uh, much of the uh, desire to engage with India is, of course, uh, tied to the dynamic of a rising China and mm -hmm. what that then means for the Indo-Pacific as a whole. And the uh, attitude and approach toward China, uh, there's strong bipartisan consensus on what that should look like. So regardless of who the president is, regardless of who controls the House or Senate, mm -hmm. you should expect a broad continuation of U.S.-India policy. So we've already mentioned China, right? <laughs> They're 10 minutes into the show and China is in the room. Uh, so Ms. Vinchamuri, uh, as a U.S. Uh, policy expert who's based in UK, I think you are, right? I am uh, at Chatham House. At Chatham House. Uh, so how do you see India-U.S. relations? You see it uh, when you see it from the outside. Do you see there's an improvement? Do you see there's bipartisan, as uh, Martin said? Or is it, um, is it something that, you know, it's in fits and starts? Uh, I, I actually say uh, to my Chatham House colleagues a lot, to my students, I teach it so as that from my point of view, this is the most interesting um, relationship to watch. Uh, and India is obviously one of the most important countries to watch. Um, the, uh, in the UK, uh, you know, the UK, as, as we know, has a very long history uh, with India. And, you know, some of that is patchy and some that's very, you know, there are multiple views around um, that history, but it, but it has clearly created very deep ties and very deep understanding and a strong relationship. So I think for the UK, watching the US-India relationship grow has been largely positive. I suspect that at times there's a bit of a concern that perhaps the UK could be on the outside of that. Um, but overall, and it, it certainly comes back uh, to the question of of security and stability and a, and a concern, of course, for the rise of China, what that means for the region has gone hand in glove with increased significance that's paid um, to India. And I think that's why we see more bipartisanship. I mean, I think you're right that historically there was a sense that the Republicans yeah. were looking to the U.S.-India relationship more. It was George Bush that really brought that U.S.-India strategic partnership to the fore that, that secured that deal. Um, and there was a sense, perhaps, that um, that the Democrats were were more focused on internal things within India. Um, that I think has changed, and I think that's certainly uh, that, that that is not where the Biden administration is. That that focus on having a very strong relationship with India as a leading partner, strategically placed as a democracy, um, as a very populous country, the most. Mm -hmm. uh, the largest country, uh, I don't know if we've crossed that point, but we're all told yeah. we will cross that point sometime uh, in the very near future. Um, and so there's no getting around it. But I think there is something very special, very unique about two very large, very diverse, very complex democracies that are strategic security partners and a global level. But obviously, in the region, um, India is just extremely important for the U.S. So there's also this view that, uh, you know, uh, the about democracies, that India is this large and noisy and sometimes unwieldy and difficult to understand uh, democracy. Things don't function like in the like the democracies of the West. Uh, so when that happens, is it difficult to fathom that uh, it takes time for relationships to, you know, to uh, to go forward when there are change of government, especially in the, you know, in the frequency that one has seen in UK uh, especially that. Yeah, I mean, if you look at all three of these democracies, uh, the UK, the US, India, it, it's, it would be very hard for any one of them to be too critical of um, turbulence in the other, because certainly in the US during the years that, that Donald Trump was president, there was a tremendous amount of turbulence. But let's be honest, there's been a lot of turbulence across the history of the United States, across multiple dimensions. Um, the UK has, you know, been exceptional on, on this dimension uh, in, in the, the last quarter of the last calendar year. And certainly, you know, India is a complex and I used to say noisy and sometimes difficult to figure out how things work. But I think there's a sense in which that's familiar to a lot of people in the US. I don't think that's, you know, there's a lack of harmony. Of course, America is very 
um, diverse. But if you, you know, the other thing I would add here is that there are, as we know, a lot of Indians in America. Some yeah. of them are Indians, some of them are Americans. They're doing extremely well. If you look at um, median household income uh, in the United States, broken down by ethnic group, Indian Americans are at the very, very top of the league. So they're prosperous, they're successful, they're hardworking, and they're linked in, right? They are now Americans and integrated. So that cultural affinity and understanding yeah. is one that continues to grow. And, you know, we, we may well soon have um, Indi an Indian American uh, woman um, <laughs> vying for the a US candidacy president and, yeah. you know, in the Republican Party. We so I'm see. going to come to that, uh, Ambassador Jasta. You've interacted with the Indian community, uh, Indian American community, uh, when you were ambassador. Um, what role can the diaspora play uh, to ensure that there is a bipartisan support towards India, whether Republican administration or Democrat in, uh, administration? Well, let me first step back and comment briefly on the bipartisan nature of the relationship. As has been said, you know, there's a lot of polarity in the United States on a range of issues, but one issue where there's great consensus is on the U.S.-India relationship. And there's several reasons for this. First, there's been a core of people on both sides of the aisle that have worked on this relationship for the last 20 years, and we talk to each other, uh, regardless of party, and we share our thoughts and ideas, and we solicit ideas from, from each other. So in that sense, there's been a certain glue. There have been perceptions that you mentioned as to why one party may be a little different than, not, than the other, and I can mention a few of the nuances that may be slightly different, but I don't think they affect the overall stability of the relationship. On trade, often in the past, the uh, Republicans have been a bit more pro-trade, the Democrats a little less so, but they're really pretty much the same now. They're, neither party is pursuing uh, a free trade agreement on energy. Uh, the Republicans have been more willing to share oil and gas and coal in addition to renewables. That's been a little more focused on renewables on the Republican side. Uh, on uh, human rights, the Republicans have chosen to discuss these issues more quietly. Sometimes some members yeah. of Congress from the Democratic side have been a little more vocal about these issues. And even on Pakistan, you saw in the last administration a more vocal break with Pakistan that I think was appreciated in India that uh, you don't see as, as visibly in this one. But those are nuances, and the bottom line is that the consensus is very strong in favor of this uh, relationship overall. And I'm sorry, you'd asked another no, no, question the, on the, that. Uh, the other question was, the, I also wanted to go into the Ukrainian conflict uh, just before, yeah. you know, because uh, that's put President Biden in a tough spot because uh, to accept India's stand, I guess, uh, you know, from uh, the national security perspective, the pressure on uh, President Biden would be tremendous to pressurize India to take a stand one way or the other. Well, again, I you have to remember, as I mentioned earlier, India and the United States are strategic partners. We don't agree on every single issue. And while the United States would have liked to see India take a more vocal position on the crisis in Ukraine, we also understand the history and the uh, intertwined relationship that India has had with the Soviet Union and later Russia over time. It's tremendous dependence on uh, Russian spare parts because it has a majority of its military equipment from Russia and it's facing China on its northern border with Russian equipment uh, and it needs its uh, assistance there. And its desire not to see Russia pushed any closer to China than it has to be and to keep open a wedge that it can have in its relationship with Russia. So that's an issue where we understand our disagreements, but we can talk about them openly and it doesn't prevent us from cooperating across a range of other areas. And as Ms. Minjamuri said about the Indian diaspora, you've yes. interacted with them. Yeah. What role could I, I think they played a tremendously important role. It's often been said that nations don't have friends, they just have interests. But I think in the U.S.-India relationship, we have friends too, because there are over 4 million Indian Americans in the United States. They're close to a million uh, Americans that live in India. These are often children that are born of Indian couples in the United States, they're U.S. citizens, and they bring a tremendous uh, glue. It's almost the secret sauce of the relationship, and I think they play a very positive role uh, overall, and I think that's one of the distinguishing features, perhaps, in the U.S.-India bilateral relationship from what you see in other countries. Now, again, the interests of the countries coincide with that, and that plays an important role, but there's a good feeling, there's a level of trust, and it's grown 
over the years as the size of the diaspora community has grown and the role that the diaspora community plays in the United States is tremendous in terms of leadership in the technology industry, in terms of people in politics. You mentioned Nikki Haley, uh, Kamala Harris. Uh, it's quite astounding. And uh, even doctors and lawyers and leaders of their communities. So it's a very important and positive part of the relationship. You know, uh, I'll come to you, um, uh, Mr. Rasser. You know, he, um, uh, Ambassador Justa mentioned uh, Nikki Haley. She did, uh, uh, during her presidential bid, she may not win, but she did say that uh, America needs to recognize, I'm paraphrasing, America needs to recognize who are the allies, who are the friends. And she mentioned Pakistan and that aid should not go towards Pakistan. Why does America continue to see Pakistan as an ally in the fight against terror? Well, that has a, a long-standing history, right? That goes back decades sure. now at this point. Um, but I think um, Ms. Haley's comments do reflect a change in thinking about how American political leaders are thinking about international relations more broadly. Now, I don't know the specific context of the remarks that she made, so I wouldn't want to comment much further on that. But overall, I do see it as reflective of how America's leaders are looking at the world in different ways and why I think also this strong bipartisan desire for a, a stronger partnership with India is there, right? It's a different way of looking at the world, probably different than um, what people here in India still think about how Americans look at the world. It, it's a different time now. And so the shifting the is sorry to interrupt. If yeah. it's the political, yes. What about the, the intelligence sector, the national security, the media, the think tanks? What about them? Do they still see Pakistan? Do they still hyphenate India with Pakistan, do you think? No, I think that's starting to shift. Mm -hmm. And again, it, you know, the US government isn't a monolith, right? So there's going to be a range of opinions on this and certain departments and agencies might have different perspectives. But I'd say broadly speaking, U, uh, U.S. leaders are looking at India differently. So it's not always coupled to Pakistan. It's, it's people recognize that India is a very important dynamic actor and a country that is poised for global leadership. It's not a, a regional matter anymore. Um, people are looking to New Delhi to step up on the global stage as a rising economy, the most populous nation on the planet and a country that's frankly uh, poised uh, for a completely different role in the world than it has played in the past. Uh, Ms. Vinjaburi, I'll move to you. Uh, you know, uh, for 50 years since India's independence, there were three presidential visits. Uh, we had uh, Eisenhower, Nixon, and uh, Jimmy Carter. And then 23 years, there are five presidential mm -hmm. visits. Uh, and uh, President Biden hasn't found the time as yet, but I guess COVID during his uh, tenure. And uh, so who do you think is a better president for India, in your view? A Republican or a Democrat? I think that the, the better president is going to be a president who is very clearly focused on um, taking forward America's global role, working consistently um, methodically, seriously, diligently on a daily basis um, with the most important countries in the world to, uh, to manage uh, free exchange. Uh, it's not entirely free anymore. There's a lot of complications around open trade, but certainly to ensure stability, predictability uh, on the global economy side, um, to, uh, to deal with the, the very difficult situation that accompanies China's rise in the Indo-Pacific. And at the moment, the, the, the best candidate for that has, is a Democratic president because the Republican Party is in disarray internally. It hasn't really managed to yet um, identify a, an unofficial leader, and we're now going to look to see who their official candidate will be, um, who really has the eye, their eye on the ball of foreign relations. So that's the number one criteria uh, from my point of view. Um, it's sort of less important whether they are Republican or Democrat. It's more whether they are really clearly focused on on America's global role. And 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 I think we we've seen some. 
problems about the past. In terms of the visits, I mean, you know, President Biden hasn't yet turned up to India, but his Secretary of State just spoke here at the Rizina Dialogue. There are many um, Americans who have been in and out of India and will continue to be. That's a very clear signal um, that this administration places extreme importance on the U.S. India relationship, I anticipate there will, I'm sure. It's not something I would be privileged to know, hmm. uh, be a visit by the president. Um, but as, as as we look ahead, I think the question is less whether there will be, if there were to be a Republican president in the next round, it's less whether that president would continue to value and invest in the India relationship Um because I think they would, it's more whether they can, whether the, the party, the Republican Party, will come together, will coalesce, um, and will have the governance capacity to look beyond America's borders in a really consistent and, and clear and serious way. And right now, um, that's what I would be worried about if I were in India. Who's gonna, who is the best leader going to be? Which party is set up to govern? Mm -hmm. Ambassador Justo? Yeah, I have a slight modification. First of all, I think there have been a number of presidential visits, starting really with Bill Clinton's at the end of his term. Then George W. Bush came, Barack Obama came twice, uh, Donald Trump came, and uh, President Biden is scheduled to come for the G20 summit uh, in September. They've all been significant visits. They've all continued to elevate the relationship and focused uh, attention on it. They've all led to what's called action-forcing events of additional accomplishments getting done. And I do think that while there may be an uncertainty now who's going to be the Republican nominee, there is a strong consensus within the Republican Party about the importance of this relationship. You see it on the Hill. You see it in members of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. And part of it is that this region, the Indo-Pacific, has really become the center of gravity of international affairs. And dealing with a range of changes, including the rise of China, and that builds the consensus about the importance of Japan, of Australia, or of India, of the Quad, of what happens in this region, of Americans, America's commitment to it. And I think we've seen that on both sides of the aisle, and I think that will continue. There's always uncertainty as to what the future holds and who might be the nominee for either party, but I think there's a pretty strong consensus across both that while some areas may be more contentious than others, this is one where people generally think uh, there's a lot at stake and a lot to, to be gained by a strong U.S.-India relationship. You want to interject? Yeah, no, I mean, I, I don't disagree with that. But I, again, I will come back to, the to you know, my view would be what happens in the U.S.-India relationship is, is connected first to, you know, the ability to govern consistently and, and clearly. Um, but it's also connected to what, what the U.S. does outside of India, but within the region. So... Um, the leader, uh, as such as he or, or she is, needs to have a clear and consistent approach to China, to ASEAN, mm -hmm. to North Korea, South Korea. I mean, there, this has got to be one of probably the most complex mm -hmm. and highly consequential regions the, in the world. I think that's stating the obvious. Um, and so what happens in the U.S.-India relationship can't really be evaluated in isolation. It has to be taken in the round. And there I think, um, I, I think we did see inconsistency and disruption and some instability in, in U.S. policy uh, across the region that, didn't, that doesn't necessarily facilitate um, that focus on, on building a strong relationship with India. So, you know, again, I think that there are problems in the Republican Party. We will see where it goes but those will inevitably have an impact on the ability to have a very strong and effective foreign policy. If I could sure. again just slightly disagree, <laughs> sure. uh, I think people have to distinguish between some of the surface remarks and what actually is happening on the ground. And I recognize that the last administration had some tumultuous elements to it, but it was the last administration that came out and clearly uh, helped establish the concept of the Indo-Pacific, something that was originally put forward by former uh, Prime Minister Abe of Japan, but really endorsed strongly by the United States. We worked with Japan to revive the Quad in 2017 and had ministerial meetings in person during COVID in 2020 and then also in 2019. And we launched many of the things that this current administration, the Biden administration, has elevated and moved forward on. So I think that you have to separate what may be some of the surface 
tumult with actually the substance of what is driving the policy. And as I said, I think if you look at a lot of the things that are happening today, uh, they really have their roots back in things that happened in the last administration and I think are going to persist in the next administration. And actually, it just continues. If we keep going backwards, it, it goes right to the George Bush era. It's the one, two, three deal. It's the nuclear deal that kind of set the path going. And I don't think either President Obama or President Biden have shifted from that path which was laid by uh, George Bush. But would you agree with that? Um, I, I do think that that that, that path has that that deal was transformative and really set in motion an extremely important basis for the US India relationship. I, I would I would though say that on the you know one of the biggest critiques of US um, policy in the region, not just India but in the region more generally right now is that it doesn't have a very clear and strong economic strategy. We know that there's the Indo-Pacific economic framework. It, it's got a long way to go, a long way to travel. Will it, what will it, it will turn into is very far from clear. Um, we know that the region is going forward with the CP, TPP, with RCEP, with any other number of arrangements that the U.S. is on the outside of. Um, that was certainly not President Obama's intention. He had a very clear vision of how you bring the region together with the U.S. absolutely central to its economic um, development. Um, and that was reversed. There are obviously, and those the reasons for that do go much further back, but nonetheless, that was reversed um, and, and not taken forward by the last administration. And, and now all successive administrations find themselves in a very difficult um, position. Um, but but I do think that there, there could be a difference. And this is where, you know, politics matter. Um, on on the, the comment about headlines, you know, it, it's true, the last administration and obviously... Um, uh, the ambassador was part of that very positive sort of moving things forward in a productive way. But in the world of international diplomacy, language matters, words matter, delivering stable and predictable and clear and serious uh, 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 um, language at the highest levels matter because they send signals not only to governments, um, some of whom are privy to the to the things that are happening below the radar, but they send signals to people hmm. um, and to businesses and to societies about what they can trust, what they can predict, what they can plan on. And I think that has a very important spillover effect. So getting that diplomacy right matters, maintaining it matters, and and building some sort of economic strategy. And right now it's not clear whether there's a partisan, a political difference between the two parties on their ability to move forward in economic strategy, a lot of that will depend on um, domestic politics in the, in the next um, 12 months. If I can just again add, which I thought was a very good point on the trade problem regionally that both the United States and India have, uh, China has been very uh, aggressive and robust in its regional strategy. Not only does it have great bilateral trade relations throughout Asia, but it has led the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement from which India withdrew uh, after seven years of negotiations before signing that agreement. And it has applied recently to join the High Standards Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement on Trans-Pacific Partnership. As has been mentioned, that was uh, a, an agreement that uh, the Trump administration withdrew from on day one, quite unexpectedly to anyone else who knew about it in the administration or was, no one was aware of it. And I think it was a strategic blunder because it really played into the hands of uh, China and hurt the U.S. My regret is that the Biden administration has come in and has continued that policy of not wanting to join the CPTPP and has really put trade off on the side. Even in the Indo-Pacific economic framework, it has said that it will not be a traditional trade agreement and market access to the United States, which is really critical for any trade agreement, will not be granted. So. At this point, I think both India and the United States not only don't have a bilateral agreement, but they don't have a good regional strategy. And unfortunately, trade has become a bit of a negative term on both sides of the aisle in the United States. It really even began during the campaign in 2016 when candidate Clinton, who had earlier said the TPP was the gold standard, sort of said she wasn't so sure she could go forward with it. And then, as I said, President Trump abruptly withdrew and now uh, it's not even on the table. And I think this is a mistake for the United States on both sides of the aisle. 
and it's going to hurt our relationships economically in the region. And economics are so important to this region uh, yes. overall. The last comment, and I'm sorry to persist on this, is I appreciate, again, the turbulence that the Trump administration created. But I can tell you, within India, President Trump was extraordinarily popular. Yes. Among the most popular people. And the relationship was extraordinarily positive. There aren't a lot of countries that can say that, but India is one of them. And it was even witnessed by his appearing at Ahmedabad at a stadium with over 100,000 people uh, Yes, in the attendance. Howdy Trump and the Howdy Modi were yeah. like huge events when they happened. Uh, I'm going to come into the final comments. Uh, uh, Mr. Raza, as we wind up, let's address China. We've already spoken about China. Can India and the US, even though we're going into election mode soon, because next year elections in both countries, and the experience India has is that foreign policy and foreign relations just go to the back seat when America goes to polls. It's it's all about domestic issues then. Um, so also in India, probably. But do you agree that India and US need to set aside those uh, compulsions, the imperfections in the relationship to deal with China now? Well, I would say one immediate domestic issue that both countries can partner on is uh, countering election disinformation. Mm -hmm. So China is increasingly aggressive when it comes to misinformation campaigns more generally, but I would expect particularly given that both countries have general elections coming up next year, that both India and the United States will be on the receiving end of significant election disinformation campaigns. So let's start thinking about how New Delhi and Washington can collaborate on, on mitigating the impact of that and ideally preventing those attacks from happening altogether. So tremendous opportunity for cooperation there. Another area, and oh, this, please elaborate yeah. on this because yeah. I think you know the media is, and you know, being from the media, we are victims of this misinformation campaigns, which come from random places. And uh, you're an expert on this, uh, so could you tell us how it can be taken forward? Well, absolutely. So it all starts with information sharing, right? Um, so the United States in rec uh, recent election cycles has. Uh, dealt with significant disinformation campaigns, so there's lessons learned. Uh, India has quite a bit of history itself, right, on being on the receiving end from Pakistan uh, okay. disinformation, for example. So having that dialogue, comparing notes on what each uh, country experienced, then informs the types of cybersecurity practices, and hmm. um, education of the, the population on how to, to deal with these issues, coming up with a quick response, fact-checking uh, capability, for example. Um, and, and we could partner with Taiwan on something like that for as well. The digital minister, Audrey Tang, in Taiwan has come up with a very robust mechanism to, to deal with that issue in that country. So again, it lends itself well to uh, bilateral cooperation and could be expanded to the Quad as well. Um, another area, and, and this is something that uh, the foreign ministers mentioned earlier this morning, is the cooperation in matters of technology, right? Um, we talked about how important the Indian diaspora is. Um, one thing that I want to emphasize is really making sure that people understand how important the Indian diaspora is for America's innovation ecosystem. You have a significant number of India-born and Indian-Americans that are the founders of technology startups. You have a significant number of Indian-Americans who are prominent business leaders in the tech industry for very large corporations. And of course, a tremendous a uh, cadre of scientists and engineers that are working in companies large and small. Through the Quad and through the U.S.-India bilateral relationship, this is an area where we can focus on the type of economic cooperation that, uh, to the ambassador's point, is, is kind of mm -hmm. lacking right now. Mm -hmm. um, and so using that as part of um, an election platform, looking to the United States and the United States looking to India on how that type of collaboration can create jobs, boost our economies, make it more competitive. And then that China dynamic that, of course, plays a part of that. So then we can start talking about, well, what are some 
um, investment restrictions that we should consider? What are some export controls where we could align our, our resources? These are the types of discussions that I think would still work very well within an election season that if, by and large will be yeah. domestically focused, but those international elements directly feed into the concerns of voters in both countries. I'll move to the political. Uh, you know, you were mentioning Nikki Haley and uh, we, there's Vivek Ramaswamy also. Uh, with more and more Indians or Indian Americans part of the political system, uh, do you think, Ms. Vijayamuri, that uh, India will play a larger role in politics in, uh, in the U.S.? Mm -hmm. You know, there's 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 been a lot of thinking and research on this, and I and one thing that and and the ambassador might I'm sure will know more, um, but one thing that I'm hearing is that and that in fact Indian Americans are perhaps less focused on India, mm. which isn't to say that they're not engaged and that they don't um, share their their wealth, but um, but they're very focused on the U.S. They're very focused on their um, lives, their work, their professional development, um, and they are engaged in the U.S., I don't think that means that, that, that they don't help, that it doesn't help the relationship, but I'm not so sure that it's a direct transfer of, you know, focused on what's happening in politics in India or in the U.S.-India relationship. I think it's more about culture and culture affinity and just getting into the psyche and the everyday experience of um, non-Indian Americans, I myself am half Indian, so this is deeply familiar to me, um, but to those who aren't, um, just having people who are prominent across all sectors of society and the economy and certainly in the public sphere in, in politics matters a lot for how Americans to sort of feel comfortable with and understand and trust um, India. And that is, you know, at a deeper level, it's, you know, these relationships, if you think about the U.S.-U.K. relationship, one of the strongest relationships in the world, it's certainly not only about politics and policy, it's about culture, education, mm -hmm. shared history, exchanges, business, intelligence, all these things. It's like multi-layered. And so I think as you get more Indians becoming Americans or being born in America, um, or living there for a period of time, that that trust and that culture affinity and that sort of shared experience builds up. And that will be in, and has been and is becoming an even uh, a very important base for yeah, it for will the enhance relationship. ties between the two countries. Absolutely, right? uh, Ambassador. Just a final comments. You know, uh, we were talking about the hill, and uh, India has come in for criticism in the past two years uh, on its domestic policies, uh, and uh, but it seems like. Um, national security and uh, economic interests have kind of overshadowed that criticism. Would you agree with that view? Well, I think there are complex views about uh, the U.S.-India relationship, and everyone doesn't view it in the same uh, manner. I think overall it's very positive, and people are very bullish on the security and the economic aspects of it. As I mentioned earlier, uh, there are some people who are more focused and maybe more critical about democratic issues in both the United States and in India. Some believe that the best way to discuss those, as uh, Secretary Blinken said, is candidly but quietly among friends. Others do it uh, more publicly. But that's part of being in democracies, the two robust democracies in which debate and discussion is a significant part of it. And so I don't think any one issue overshadows the relationship. I think it's a relationship that covers a broad range of issues. Security and economics are among the most uh, significant of it. And if I could just add one or two points, to, uh, you know, I was mentioning, and I believe that not engaging regionally on a trade strategy is not as much an economic issue as it is a strategic issue because mm -hmm. it's how China deals with the region. I'm fully sensitive to... Uh, the concerns about trade and how it's affected American manufacturing and the need to deal with some of these issues. But we've still got to come up with a strategy to make the United States and India players in regional economics and trade. And I'm afraid that our concern about the trade component of it has hurt the strategic component of it. And then the final comment I'd make, because I agree with uh, the comments made about the Indian American diaspora, and again, they're not a unified group, 
Some people are more focused on the bilateral relationship. Some people are more focused on what's going on in the United States. But I was struck when I was ambassador one time when I met a governor of a state, and she said to me at the end of the meeting, her most important investment is in the United States, her most significant and important investment. And I was trying to think, did she own stock in which tech company, mm -hmm. this one, that one? She said to me, no, my children. Oh. And if you look at the number of children of senior officials from India in the United States, it tells you something about the relationship, the level of trust, the importance that parties on both sides uh, give to it. And that cannot be uh, minimized, in my opinion. But it's not something that one can make uh, simple uh, statements about or generalities. A lot of it is, a, you know, India is a complex country. The United States is, and the relationship has its own complexities. But it's very strong and very important. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, Ms. Vinjamuri. It's been a very interesting uh, session, and we get to know more about how the U.S. sees India and how the Indians uh, see America. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.